us getting underway, largely because we have a, a, a real a host of, of wonderful, wonderful speakers, and I don't want to miss a minute of what it is they're going to say. Uh, I wanted to get us underway. All the people who are waiting outside have now uh, come in and, and have seats. And um, I want to begin this uh, by saying thank you to a number of different people. Um, without whom this simply would not have been possible to do. Um, we have a number of sponsors, uh, and the first sponsor that I want to thank is the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, at the Presidential Chair Funds, which they gave me to use for events like this, um, has very generously funded this event and other events uh, in the interest of criminal justice reform. And so that's the spirit in which we proceed tonight. So I'm deeply grateful to the university for providing those funds. Um, and there have been a number of other sponsors who have assisted us as well. So there is um, a group that I will talk about in a moment called Smart on Crime. Um, but the Community Corrections Partnership, uh, the uh, United Way of Santa Cruz who has contributed uh, a lot of organizational activity and, and, and a, a particular person who's been instrumental in what we've been doing. Barrios Unidos, who's been doing uh, restorative justice work in Santa Cruz County for a very long time, uh, also has assisted us with tonight's events. Um, and without the, without the uh, help of all of these groups, without the synergy that they've been able to create, we would not have been able to do this. That said, I want to mention several people by name um, who just made extraordinary contributions to the organization of tonight in addition to the distinguished speakers who you will hear from in a moment. Uh, Joni White is the uh, University Events Coordinator at UC Santa Cruz, and she is simply extraordinary. Um, I've done several events with her now with the UC Presidential Chair, uh, and I, I, I realize that I can't function without her. <laughs> so I really hope, Joni, you don't ever go away, because I wouldn't be helpless. She's just extraordinary, and she thinks of all of the details, and a hundred of them, that I would never think of, and, and she's been instrumental in, in putting together tonight's events. Um, Sarah Emmert from the United Way has been equally wonderful in putting this event together. She knows this community uh, backwards and forwards. Um, she's the go-to person um, whenever I need to understand who and, and, and where we need to be and who needs to be contacted and so on. And she's just put her heart and soul into planning tonight's event. And Angela Chestnut also has been extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily helpful. Uh, as many of you know, uh, she's assistant to Supervisor John Leopold, and she's she's uh, an instrumental uh, member of a, a group, uh, Smart on Crime, that I'll talk about in a second. Um, she keeps us on track, and she's been just uh, really crucial in getting things done, organizing things, reminding us of what needed to be done and who needed to be contacted. So without those folks, um, really, literally, tonight's evening would not have been possible. Um, of course, I want to thank our distinguished guests and speakers who you will hear from. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming here. Um, in a way, it's remarkable that uh, on a Thursday evening, there's a, a line of people uh, out the door to come into an event to talk about restorative justice. Mm -hmm. Um, in another sense, I guess, um, maybe you are reflecting something that a lot of us in this community and communities around the country are feeling, which is that there could not be a better time for a community to share an evening in which we talk about healing. Uh, we talk about uh, justice, which is truly restorative. Um, justice, which responds to the needs of all of the members of the community. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to hear from people. We're all going to learn from people. But we're going to have an opportunity to interact and talk about these things. When I first moved to Santa Cruz some 40 years ago, um, I w was, of course, struck by the physical beauty of, of the place. I'd grown up in Philadelphia. I'd never lived in a place remotely as beautiful as this. But what, what really struck me and what really led me to fall in love with this community and not want to live anywhere else ever um, is that it really was. I could feel it as soon as I got here. It's a community. Um, it's a remarkable community. It was 40 years ago. It, it still is. Um, I was reminded of this um, in, in watching the tragedy that unfolded in Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh. 
and I heard, in, in addition to the, to the tremendous anguish that the people of Squirrel Hill were going through after this horrible event that, that occurred there, I heard them talking about their community, and I heard them talking about their community in a way that reminded me of my community. Um, not necessarily uh, socioeconomically or demographically, but a community that was connected, a community that, that, that hurt collectively, that when something happened in the community, even though people in the community might disagree about what to do in response to it, we felt each other's pain. And we try as best as possible to have each other's back um, and to connect to each other. And I see tonight's event as a continuation of that spirit. In Squirrel Hill, as here, we are a community that values compassion. We value inclusivity and mutual respect. Um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is how to extend those values into the criminal justice system even more deeply than we've already been able to do. I work on criminal justice issues, so when I came to Santa Cruz, I was impressed by and also fell in love with the fact that we are a community that first and foremost, of course, respects and responds to the needs and concerns of survivors of crime. You can't have a community unless people feel safe. But we are also, and I think in the this is one of the things that makes us a little bit different. We are also concerned about the needs and the plight of survivors of the things that cause crime, including poverty, drug and alcohol addiction, homelessness, and mental illness, and other things. Santa Cruz is unique because we strive to understand this complexity uh, and to take into account all of our members out of the recognition that we are all part of this community. Tonight's event is a uh, uh, grows out of, a, of a, a, a series of meetings that a group of us in, uh, who somewhat immodestly call ourselves smart on crime, um, <laughs> how smart we are remains to be seen, but uh, the smartest thing that we do, I can say, uh, in addition to meeting, we've been meeting together for about eight years, um, is we hold events like this. We've, we've, we've held, I think this is the fourth or fifth one of these community events that we've held where we try to provide some kind of community education, but really the point of, of these events and the point of tonight's events is to bring the community together to think about things that are of importance to the criminal justice system in Santa Cruz County. So there are elected officials, there are law enforcement officials, there are some academics, there are some people from the legal community in Santa Cruz, and they have put in their time as a voluntary group, and we meet, as I say, sort of sporadically, but regularly for about eight years, and, and we had one of these events about a year and a half or so ago. You may remember, some of you were there, I recognize you from being there. And at the end of that event, um, it was an event that was held in the Civic Auditorium. At the end of that event, we took a survey. We're going to take one tonight as well. And I'd encourage you to fill it out. Uh, because we take it seriously. We took last year's events survey seriously. And somewhat to my surprise, the one thing that, that the majority of the people attended that event said they wanted to hear more about was restorative justice. Um, and so we took the results of that survey, we sat down, we started to think about restorative justice. And we started to think about why the community wanted to hear about this. We were inspired by the fact that that was what they saw as the next step in Santa Cruz County in terms of improving our criminal justice system. And we set about the task, it took us about a year to do it, of figuring out who we wanted to be here tonight to talk with us as a community about these issues. And so what you're going to hear tonight is you're going to hear from people who have a different model of restorative justice that they work with in their community, including somebody who works with these issues in our community, but very different ways of approaching the issue of restorative healing justice, justice which takes all of the members of the community into account, their needs, their concerns, and does so in a way that is as effective as we can make it. Um, it is, it is a, a part of, I mean, not only is it part of the, our smart our crime agenda of public discussion, public education, public input, public conversation, but it's also a way of advancing what a, a, a project that many of you I know know about because you're directly involved in it, something called the Blueprint for Shared Safety. Um, and this is something that has come out of uh, work that was done by the Californians for Safety and Justice. Um, in, in response to the fact that the, the face of criminal justice, this, the responsibility for delivering criminal justice in California has been shifted over the last 10 or so years, 
away from the state and back into the communities. And in communities like ours, I think it's a very, very good thing. In some other communities, it may not be. But in Santa Cruz County, this community, we're ready for it. Um, we're going to make the best of that opportunity. And so the blueprint for shared safety is something that the Chief of Probation has been involved in developing. There have been meetings. There have been focus groups. There's a table in the back, and I would encourage you to, to, uh, that this, if this blueprint for shared safety is something that is new to you, please, before you leave tonight, pick up one of the handouts and, and, and look at it and, and think about getting involved in it, because it really is an opportunity. You don't have to be an expert. It's an opportunity for community members to come to these meetings and have input into what we're doing in this county to make justice better, to make it healing, to make it restorative, in the ways that we do it now and the ways that we might do it in the future. So we're going we're gonna to talk about restorative justice. You're going to hear from a phenomenal speaker who I will introduce to you in a moment. And then we're going to turn over the, the, tonight's uh, activities to Supervisor John Leopold, who is going to moderate a panel, um, distinguished speakers who are going to talk to us about three different models of restorative justice. There will be opportunities both at the end of the keynote and also at the end of the panel for you to be question and answer. And then at the very end of it, um, I'll make some, some summary uh, comments and remind you again to fill out the questionnaire because we really do see this as the beginning, not the end of a conversation about restorative justice. This is the first step. We realize that this county has actually been doing restorative justice. Our probation department has been doing it with juveniles for a very long period of time. What we want to see is if we can think about ways we might do it in the adult criminal justice system, and perhaps even make it better in the juvenile system. So this is not something that we're going to be able to solve or resolve tonight, but it's something that we, we, we will never solve or resolve if we don't begin talking about it. And so tonight is an opportunity for us to begin that conversation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, a, a, a really remarkable woman who is going to give the keynote and really focus our attention on um, some critically important issues. Uh, Fania Davis um, is the name that came up a year ago when we first started talking about whether and how we could do this. Um, and she is um, perhaps certainly one of the nations and perhaps the world's leading experts on restorative justice. She is a long time successful, dedicated social activist and civil rights attorney whose commitment to these issues really begins way back in 1963. Um, some of you are old enough to remember that in September of 1963, there was a terrible, tragic bombing which took place at a church, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, it was a momentous event in the history of the civil rights movement. It changed really the trajectory of the civil rights movement in, in certain respects. But it also uh, changed uh, Fania Davis's life mission. Uh, two of the four uh, young African American girls who were killed in that bombing were friends of hers. And from that point on, uh, she dedicated herself to issues of civil rights and of justice. Um, of empowering people who the society keeps voiceless as best it can. Um, she has been a, a fierce advocate and an and effective advocate in the civil rights movement, the black liberation movement, and the women's movement, and the prisoners' rights movement, the peace movement, anti-racial violence, anti-apartheid apartheid movements, and on and on. Um, she, in addition to getting a law degree from UC Berkeley, she got a, a, a a PhD in indigenous knowledge and studying indigenous practices in Africa gave her insights into the, the, the essence of the restorative justice movement. She came back from that experience uh, to bring restorative justice to Oakland, California. She's the founding director of the restorative justice of, of Oakland youth, something called Our Joy. Um, and her numerous honors uh, go on and on and on, um, all extraordinarily well deserves. An Ubuntu Award for Service to Humanity, um, an Award for Excellence in Restorative Justice, the World Trust Healing Justice Award. Um, she was named by the Los Angeles Times as uh, one of the new civil rights leaders of the 21st century. She is a 
brilliant, captivating speaker. Um, she is a, a, an extraordinary advocate for all of those issues, but tonight she is going to talk to you about her passion, which is restorative justice. We are fortunate to have her here, and please join me in welcoming her to our stage. Sawubona is the singular. If I meet you on a dusty road or in the village marketplace, I say Sawubona. Can you say Sawubona? Sawubona. As I see you. <coughs> Beyond the exterior, I see your spirit. I see the gift that you are to the world. I see your goodness. I see you beyond the worst thing that you have ever done. I see you beyond the worst thing that has ever been done to you. Restorative justice is rooted in indigenous wisdom and in the African-centered worldview that human beings are good by nature and have equal moral worth and dignity. This is a core value of restorative justice, respect, is about seeing and honoring that goodness, seeing it in everyone. So much of our work in restorative justice involves this kind of seeing. And restorative justice is not just about doing work with people in the justice system, in prisons, in schools, it's not just doing work on the outside, it's doing work on the inside. To show up and to be able to see the goodness in others and have compassion for others, we have to see the goodness in ourselves. We have to have compassion for ourselves. Restorative justice invites us to see the best in others and to bring forth our best selves as we walk in the world. It's a challenge for me personally. I know that I'm very hard on myself. I can be judgmental, and I know uh, that I need to be more gentle and compassionate with myself so that I can bring that medicine uh, to others. So anyone doing restorative justice uh, needs to have, of course, a radical critique of systems, of history, uh, of racial capitalism, of sexism, of heteropatriarchy, and all of that. And we need to be doing some sort of mind, body, spirit awareness practice, whether it's prayer, meditation, yoga, or qigong. I want to thank Professor Amy, uh, Sarah Emmert, uh, UCSC, United Way, and all of the sponsors and organizers for inviting me to speak at this Smart on Crime Community Forum. I want to acknowledge all of you in the audience, Community Forum and community members, educators, justice professionals, uh, young people. I know you're here tonight because you want to reduce suffering in the world. Suffering that just seems to pile on with every passing day. Restorative justice shares this ethos of reducing harm, of not responding to harm with more harm, which is what our justice system does. Restorative justice shares Mahatma Gandhi's view of justice. That act alone is just which does no harm to either party to a dispute. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge and call the names of the Ohlones and the Costanoans and the other original people of this land. Oh. Oh. <laughs> in invoking the ancestors of this land, we acknowledge this is an occupied land. 
This is a post-genocidal land, and like the original harm of slavery, we have yet as a nation to face and tell the whole truth about this genocide, take responsibility for it, and offer reparations. Yep. Justice is about recognizing pain, taking responsibility for it, and repairing it. Does that sound familiar? Remember the elevator girls talking to Senator Je uh, Jeff Flake during the Kavanaugh? Recognizing pain, taking responsibility for it, and repairing it. That is justice, she said. <laughs> Though we anoint ourselves as the chosen ones, as, a, as the beacon of democracy for the entire world, we can't forget our nation was born in the blood of slavery and genocide. Just last month, the second Monday in October, is traditionally celebrated as Columbus Day. But saying Happy Columbus Day is like saying Happy Genocide Day, Happy Slavery Day. The good thing is that four states and more than 60 cities now celebrate, now celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, including you here in Santa Cruz. <laughs> I want to acknowledge you for that. So tonight I want to just share a little bit more about my personal story and how I came to restorative justice and why restorative justice is important to me. And I also want to give you a brief overview of restorative justice, its history, its principles, its practices, and a bit about the data. And you'll hear about existing programs from our wonderful uh, speakers, panelists, who will come after. I'll touch on just a bit our work in Oakland, especially the work to end the school to prison pipeline. I was born, as Craig said, in Birmingham, Alabama during the Civil Rights era. Because of pervasive racial terror, we knew my native city as Birmingham. And Dr. King said it was the most racist city, most segregated city in the nation. And as Craig said, the murder of two close childhood friends, Carol Roberts and Cynthia Wesley, in many ways I dedicate my work to today, especially with youth, the, their murder crystallized within me a passion for justice leading to a lifetime of activism. I also became a civil rights attorney, as you heard earlier. But after almost three decades of angrily fighting injustice as a trial lawyer, and as an activist in so many movements, in all of the movements of my time. And after experiencing a police invasion of my home, with my husband almost being killed by police, solely because we were working with the Black Panthers in San Diego, and after seeing my sister shortly thereafter being targeted because of her political activities, because of her socialist beliefs, her communist beliefs, and because of her work with George Jackson and with the Soledad brothers, and all of the work that she was doing about around prisons way back then, after seeing her being targeted by then Governor Ronald Reagan and then President Nixon, targeted for a legal lynching, and being the target of the 10 most wanted FBI list at that time. And after the, the, the difficult and challenging but ultimately successful struggle to save her life, and I just want to honor Bettina Aptaker who's here today, and she was a big part of the success that we won um, in the international struggle to free Angela Davis. But after experiencing all of that, experiencing Birmingham, we lived on Dynamite Hill in Birmingham, Alabama, literally. That was the name of our neighborhood. And our father had to join with other fathers uh, to organize an armed defense of their families. Our church was bombed. The church across the street, uh, the, the house across the street from the church was bombed. Houses in our neighborhood were bombed. 
Because we dared, we dared organize against racial segregation. And the bombs were attempts to terrorize us into silence. So after all of this angry fighting, and I was angry, um, I, after 30 years of that, fighting in the courtroom, fighting on the streets, fighting sexism, fighting racism, fighting capitalism, um, you name it, I became ill. I went, I, was, I, I sort of fell out of balance, and I intuitively knew that I had too much fire, I needed, I needed water, I needed more soothing waters, I had too much anger, I needed more spiritual and creative and healing energies in my life. I kind of intuitively knew that. And synchronistically, I found out about this PhD program so that I could study with healers all over the world, especially in Africa. I did that and came back and found out about restorative justice and started um, restorative justice for Oakland youth. <coughs> restorative justice for Oakland youth, our joy, um, works with justice systems in schools and in communities throughout the nation. We do training, we do consultation, we do technical assistance to promote restorative policies and practices. Our joy successes have been featured on PBS, NPR, and the New York Times, CBS, the Smithsonian, StoryCorps, and elsewhere. After launching pilot programs in Oakland schools that increased academic outcomes while completely eliminating violence, the young people learned how to talk through instead of fight through their differences. After reducing suspensions by 87%, actually the suspension rate was reduced by 87% at our first pilot school, um, the school district became very interested in restorative justice and with some organizing by youth and studies on the effectiveness of restorative justice, they adopted restorative justice as official school policy. And we are very intentional, our joy is, about doing work that helps transform people's lives, young people's lives, teachers' lives, uh, youth serving adults' lives, as well as transform systems. It's not enough just to, as important as it is, to transform our individual lives. <clears throat> it's not enough just to work on transforming systems. So our work is about doing both systems transformation work and individual uh, and community healing work. Uh, can we get the PowerPoint going? Am I supposed to do that? <laughs> So, just a brief history. Restorative justice first arose in Ontario, Canada in the early 70s, and then in Indiana, in the U.S. in the mid-70s, out of the uh, frustration of persons harm, persons causing harm, communities and justice professionals with the dysfunction of our criminal justice system. The Mennonites were central in launching restorative justice in this country. Inspired, let me just read this, restorative justice is a worldview rooted in indigenous uh, principles and a theory of justice that emphasizes bringing together everyone affected by wrongdoing to address their needs and responsibilities and to heal the harm as much as possible. So I've italicized a few of these words. Uh, first of all, restorative justice is a worldview and a theory of justice. Many think of restorative justice as something we do after harm has occurred, as a conflict transformation process, as a conflict resolution process. 
It can be used in that way, of course it's often used in that way, but it is also a set of principles, a world view, a way of being present in the world and on the earth. Ways that bring healing and wholeness instead of ways that bring devastation and, and discord and violence. So it's both a theory of justice, a conflict resolute a transformation method, as well as a worldview or a set of principles. It brings together, as a theory of justice, it brings together everyone affected by wrongdoing and the way that the Community Forum on Restorative Justice or your, your project on restorative justice is doing or contemplates doing. Uh, it's communitarian in that sense. Restorative justice essentially invites a shift in the locus of the justice project from individuals to, actually from experts to communities. From experts to ordinary people, from systems to community. It's profoundly democratic and inclusive and communitarian in that sense. Needs and responsibilities is also italicized here. Restorative justice is a justice that addresses needs, whether it's the need of the person who has been harmed or the need of the person that causes harm. Responsibility. The responsibility of the person causing harm, often the responsibility of the community or the responsibility of, of structural racism or structural violence. It's important that we not simply remain um, uh, sequestered in an individual's fears when we're asking about responsibility. If a young person, if a young person is, is, is selling drugs, you know why, you know? Let's not just stay focused on the responsibility of that young person. Let's look at structural poverty and let's come up with a plan for the child, not only the child to, re to repair the harm, but for uh, the community uh, to take some action uh, to repair the structural harm. So restorative justice um, challenges the assumptions and the dominant discourse about justice. That's how it's different from arbitration. That's how it's different from mediation, at least from conventional mediation. That's how it's different from um, um, alternate, uh, alternative dispute resolution. It may be, sound similar to all of those, but it is different in the sense that it invites a paradigm shift in the way that we think about and do justice. It challenges the fundamental assumptions and the dominant discourse about justice. That's how it differs from all of these other alternatives to the uh, uh, um, uh, prevailing justice system that have proliferated over the last decades. So, um, ours is a justice system that is based on a Roman notion of justice as just deserts. So if I cause harm to you, that creates an imbalance in the scales of justice. And the only way to rebalance the scales is for harm to be caused to me, right? So ours is a system that harms people who harm people to show that harming people is wrong. <laughs> yeah, go figure, right. But what does that do? That replicates harm, that reproduces harm, that metastasizes harm. And we know from trauma studies that people who are harmed and not healed go on to cause further harm. So we set off this endless cycle of harm that comes to saturate our lives. Restorative justice seeks to flip the script. Well, let's talk about the three questions that our justice, our prevailing justice system asks, and three questions that restorative justice asks. 
Our retributive system asks, one, what law or rule was broken? Two, who broke it? Three, what punishment is deserved? So charge or blame, adjudicate, and punish. That sums up our justice system. Charge, adjudicate, or blame, uh, adjudicate, and punish. Restorative justice asks three very different questions. It's concerned about harm. It sees crime as harm to lives and, and relationships instead of violating rules and laws. It's concerned about that harm. And it asks, secondly, what are the needs and responsibilities of everyone impacted by the harm? And three, how do all impacted, not, not just justice professionals, not just experts, people who are impacted on the ground, how do they come together to make decisions about justice, to figure out how to heal the damage um, to the degree possible? Now, let me just talk, for, it, I, I'm waiting for the time, okay. Okay. Um, I just want to tell a, a little anecdote or share this and hopefully that will um, um, help understand the, the differences again between our system, our, our current justice system and restorative justice. So imagine that you're, you're in the streets and you are, you're looking or you see an older woman, maybe in her 80s, and three little ones, uh, probably her great-grandchildren, um, and she's walking and holding the hands of, of, of her little ones, and suddenly a young man comes up from behind, tackles her to the ground, and grabs her purse and runs away. You could say that our justice system would respond by stepping over the grandmother who's still on the ground, stepping over the children who are crying and traumatized, and running after the young man to charge or blame, to adjudicate and punish. Restorative, retributive justice, rather, doesn't really address the needs of people, especially persons harmed, communities harmed. It seeks to blame and punish. Restorative justice would probably do what you would do. First, you would go to see about the grandmother. Does she need medical assistance? Call 911, give her CPR, take care of her needs, and then address the needs of the children they're traumatized, they're crying, calm them down. And go after the young man. Do you recognize the pain that you caused? Do you take responsibility for the pain that you caused? And what can you do to repair the pain that you caused? And as I said, we may find that this young man is taking the purse to help pay for food for his family. Restorative justice will get that story, will get the backstory, and take that into account when coming up with a plan to repair the harm. So you could say that um, that restorative justice is based on three R's: uh, relationship. Relationship is everything. Uh, restorative justice is a relational justice, and we know the ancients have always known that we are connected. We are interrelated. Science is starting to understand that now. But the ancients have always known that we participate in a luminous web of interrelatedness. We as humans, and we as all, beings on this earth. Ubuntu, I am because we are. 
I am a person through my relationships with others and my relationship with the earth. That is who I fundamentally am. I am my relationships. We are family, we are relatives. In Lakesh, Mitakyo Yasin is Lakota Su. In Lakesh is Mayan, for I am the other you. So the second R is respect. And it's respect is deeper than just not rolling your eyes at somebody. You know? <laughs> uh, respect is, is Salibona, you know, is seeing the goodness and seeing the spirit and seeing the gift beyond what has been done to you or someone, beyond what someone has done. That is respect, seeing that goodness in others and seeing it in yourself. Um, and responsibility is a third R. Because we are so deeply and intimately connected, we have a responsibility. There's a, there's a, we live in a web of reciprocal connection and responsibility. Because we are family, we are responsible for taking care of one another. And when our relationships go south, when they become oppressive, when they become a source of suffering, when they become unequal, when they become violent, we are responsible for making those relationships right, for repairing them. That is the essence of restorative justice. So I want to just focus on three models, although there are more than three models. I know from talking to some of the panelists that they'll be talking about um, models that are not mentioned here, but these are the three primary models of restorative justice, I believe. Uh, first, uh, victim-offender dialogue. You know, I don't like to use those words, victim-offender. Uh, generally when I talk, I don't, but you know, when they're the name of a model, you, and the model's name hasn't changed yet. <laughs> I have to, but I don't like to say victim because again, it reduces the person to the worst thing that's happened to them. I don't like to say offender because it reduces a person to the worst thing that they have done. It reifies them, you know? It over-identifies them with, with uh, the harm. Uh, so I try to avoid that, but here I, I can't. Um, so victim-offender dialogue um, is the smallest, you can see visually. Uh, it involves a person harm, a person causing harm, and a trained facilitator. If you want to see a, a pretty amazing victim-offender dialogue that occurred um, between the survivors, uh, the mother and the daughter um, of a, a, a family member who was killed, um, and they met with the killer of their loved one, uh, who had already gone through the criminal justice system and had been sentenced. And this restorative victim-offender victim -offender dialogue took place inside uh, of the carceral facility. It took two years before they came together. You don't bring together a person's causing harm with a person's harm, willy-nilly. You, you do a lot of preparation to make sure that no further harm will occur once they get together. So it took them two years of writing through the train facilitator before they came together. And if you want to see that or learn about that, uh, that model, I suggest you take a look at Meeting with a Killer. I mean, it's a very you know, dramatic name, and it's almost too dramatic and melodramatic. But it's a very good film, um, and it will, uh, it's, it's, it's very moving. Uh, and you learn a lot about how these processes work, how that particular model works, victim offender dialogue. It's used for severe violence, it's used for nonviolence, it's used for uh, many different levels of crime. Uh, family group conferencing is the second model that I have here. It was uh, uh, pioneered in New Zealand. Okay. Um, and it was used there to virtually make uh, youth incarceration um, obsolete. They're shutting down youth prisons in New Zealand. Uh, after, yeah. So, not that this 
Family Group Conferencing Program in New Zealand is perfect. They have lots of challenges, lots of issues, and they still have problems with disparities, racial disparities with the Maori, like we do in this country. Uh, but they have, uh, they have done, uh, they made uh, tremendous gains, uh, especially with the shutting, with the, with the decarceration uh, of youth. Uh, their law was passed in 1989. Um, and then Peacemaking Circles is the largest. We use that in Oakland. Uh, it's based on indigenous, uh, especially Native American, uh, peacemaking circles in the restorative justice movement. Uh, the, one of the leading trainers of, of peacemaking circles is Kay Pranas, and she wrote a book called The Little book, book of Peacemaking Circle Processes, which I recommend uh, if you want to learn more about that model. And she always makes clear that she uh, was taught this process by Tlingit Tagish people in Canada and that they authorized her to use this process. So there's no hint of appropriation, cultural appropriation, which is really, of course, important for us. Um, my time is almost up, um, but those are the three primary models. I'm going to go through the rest of it pretty quickly. I'm not even going to talk about the elements of the circle process. You can read about that in the book that I just mentioned. Um, uh, talked about the relational aspects of restorative justice. So, just very briefly about some of the work that we've done in Oakland. Um, we started a model, or a pilot rather, uh, in 2008 um, in a high crime area, um, high violence, uh, under resourced area uh, of Oakland. And after about a year and a half, we were able to. to uh, uh, reduce suspension rates by 87%. And, you know, that's really important because you've heard about the school-to-prison pipeline, right? I mean, if we want to reduce incarceration, if we want to reduce adult crime and incarceration, let's start with the schools. Keeping a kid in school is the strongest protective factor against violence and, and, uh, and adult incarceration. If a child is suspended, is kicked out of school, uh, their chances of being incarcerated triples. If they're, if they're suspended in the ninth grade once, the UCLA Civil Rights Project study that came out a few years ago uh, found that their chance of in, in being incarcerated triples. Their chance of, of dropping out doubles. And most of you uh, law enforcement persons in, 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 the, in the audience know that our jails and prisons are filled with high school dropouts. 75% of state inmates are high school dropouts. So doing this work in schools is, is so important as an upstream intervention um, against um, mass incarceration. And very quickly, this was just the first pilot um, after, this, after the school district adopted restorative justice as, as official school discipline policy, uh, it became uh, uh, it was adopted in many other schools, and there was a, a study that came out. I can find it here. So you can see that um, in restorative justice schools, the blue bars, uh, the graduation rates after three years of, of implementation increased by 60% compared to only 7% in non restorative justice schools. Reading scores went up 128% in restorative justice schools versus 11% in non-restorative justice schools. Chronic absence went down 24%. Schools became a place where the kids wanted to be because they felt seen. They felt heard. They felt a sense of belonging, especially through using those circle processes. And they thrived. Young people who were not expected to graduate actually graduated in many cases with a 3.5 or 3.0 plus average. Uh, young people were expected to die an early death of gun violence or go into the school to prison pipeline, uh, graduated and thrived uh, through the work of restorative justice, which is a relational justice. And we know that the single most important factor for a child in academic, positive ac academic outcomes and social outcomes is having a caring adult, having a strong, positive relationship. And so we take that, that, that truth uh, in restorative justice and we, 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 we scaffold uh, our children with 
multiple positive caring relationships with adults and others. So very quickly, studies, uh, international studies show that victims are more satisfied when they go through the restorative justice process. Um, they show reduced fear, reduced uh, post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome um, after doing a restorative process. And of course, we know that victims don't have a voice because our system just blames and punishes and doesn't pay attention to the needs of the persons who have been harmed. Uh, but in these processes, restorative processes, victims feel heard, they feel seen, they have a voice. That's the graph showing the drop in incarceration rates after passing the restorative justice law in New Zealand. You can save, oh no, this is, oh this isn't that way. I want to go to the fiscal response, the fiscal, oh. Okay, there's one slide I thought I had there, but I, I don't see it. I just wanted to note for those of you who are interested in, in fiscal savings, there's studies that show that for every $1 spent on restorative justice in the criminal justice system, we can save $8, $8 eight criminal justice dollars. Restorative justice, because it's a set of principles and a worldview, it has many different possible applications, whether in homes to address uh, domestic disputes, in workplaces, um, in justice system, of course, in schools, uh, and also to address mass social harm. That's another discussion. We, but uh, that is an application of restorative justice as well. <coughs> So uh, I want to close, my time is up. I uh, want to again acknowledge all of you for being here today um, and, and just say that I know that the times that we're living in are, are really just unbelievable, <laughs> insane. And I know that we have a president was a billionaire, was created a cabinet of billionaires. This is the time of the victory of a racist, Islamophobe, homophobe, misogynist, xenophobe, transphobe, and climate change denier in the White House. But let us not forget, it's also a time of activism that is bubbling up with energy and power all over, the likes of which we have not seen in decades. Uh, including restorative justice, including Black Lives Matter, <coughs> including Standing Rock, the gun violence movement, the Me Too movement, immigration movements. And truth telling about slavery uh, is happening by universities all over. And white people who are researching uh, their ancestral complicity uh, with slavery and lynching and the slave trade, I am seeing things, of, the likes of which I have never seen before. So, as a nature, we can have the poison, but right next to it, you will find the antidote. So this is a time of great hope, and I just want to acknowledge you uh, for having hope, and not just for having hope, but uh, for being hope, for being hope in the face of this catastrophe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fanya. My name is uh, John Leopold, the Santa Cruz County <coughs> Supervisor. And we have some time for some questions here, so I, I want to make sure that people who came here this evening to hear you have a chance to ask questions. We are going to have two microphones on either side of these aisles, and we'd like you to come up to the microphone. And because we only have a, a few short minutes to uh, ask questions to Fania, uh, I, I want you to, to be succinct in your questioning so we can hear from Fania instead of the question. Um, and, and maybe if, uh, if, uh, if you would, uh, if, if people want to get up, uh, there's the people who have microphones, uh, Angela and Cassie uh, both have it, uh, maybe you can move to the middle and people could come up and ask questions. Um, uh, I'll just uh, ask a question uh, to find you to get us started. Uh, California is going through a prison realignment system. 
And from your perspective, uh, has that, uh, are you seeing better programs coming out here in California because of prison realignment, uh, or is it just moving people around in different places? Um, well, I'm seeing, I'm seeing lots of great programs in the community. And that's probably tangentially related to, to uh, prison realignment. But I'm just uh, really amazed at the bubbling up of, um, and, and the gains of uh, abolitionist efforts, uh, for example. Um, and in Oakland, for example, we have so many community-based uh, justice programs. Uh, when we first started, um, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth first started in 2008. We were like the only restorative justice program. Now there are about 15. Uh, so I'm seeing a real, you know, bubbling up of community-oriented justice programs. I mean, just like, you know, the response that you had with people tonight. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing that. Yeah. yeah, here in Santa Cruz, we try to, we try to invest our money uh, for the sheriff, for probation, and also treatment programs, and we see that broadly. So we're trying to invest in the community to make sure that we actually reduce recidivism, and we've actually done research that shows that it's working, that we're reducing recidivism and helping people uh, so they don't <coughs> end up back in our county jail. Excellent. Yeah. So there's a and question. And the money that and you save money, you know, you don't have to cry, and you can reinvest that money into community-based uh, solutions. Absolutely. We work with the Pew. Uh, uh, and uh, MacArthur Foundations in an in initiative called Results First, which found that recidivism costs are over $40,000 for juveniles and over $100,000 uh, for adults. So we, we know the value of it, and we're trying to figure out how to reinvest that uh, into the system. Absolutely. So there's a question over here. Mishmi Tukis. My name is Canyon, and my question is, when you mentioned uh, restorative justice and aligning with indigenous values and pedagogies, what steps would involve uh, including indigenous perspectives in our work and uh, what other recommendations would you have around aligning with those like action steps, I guess? Action steps. Um, yeah, well, you know, when I talk about the indigenous roots of restorative justice uh, and honoring them, um, this can be fraught. This can be, you know, something that um, has risks, and is specifically speaking of the risk of cultural appropriation. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, and so, for example, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth staff is actually traveling. I'm no longer, I'm, I'm retired, but their staff of 10 or 11 are going to Africa uh, in December to learn from a healer, a traditional healer in the Sangoma tradition in South Africa, uh, how um, traditionally uh, peacemaking was done, traditionally how, um, how uh, conflict uh, transformation was done. Um, and then they're going to come back to this country you know, uh, with that and, and apply it to the peacemaking circles that we do in this country. And I tell that story because um, Everybody has indigenous roots. White people, you know, have indigenous roots. I mean, white people go all the way back to Africa, you know? Uh, and they just found, there was a study that just came out that said that uh, language originated in Africa. Of course languages originated in Africa because that's where humanity originated from. So, um, you know, I always urge white people to, really, to, to do, some, do some research, some ancestral research. Are you Celtic, you know, uh, are you Sami, uh, you know, and if so, once you find out what your ancestral mind is, start researching the peacemaking uh, uh, traditions. Uh, yeah, so that's one of them. Mm -hmm. I would also, would also recommend becoming familiar with the indigenous peoples of whose land you're on. I really appreciate your knowledge right there, but to also continue that work to ensure that there's no erasure. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and, and let me just, just to piggyback on what, what that last thing you said, and you know, I think we need to start thinking about truth processes to tell the whole truth about the genocide. 
and to take responsibility for it and to repair it. Recognize, uh, take responsibility and repair the genocide. You, you know, it's... Uh. Yes, totally. Totally. You know, we live by this myth of American innocence. Uh, and it's time for us to, you know, to really start seeing ourselves for what we really are, you know? Because if we don't, if, if we don't see ourselves for who we truly are, then we'll keep repeating the same thing. Well, as Maya Angelou said, history in all its wrenching pain cannot be unlived. But if we face it with courage, it need not be lived again. So it's time for us to face our history and all of its ugliness that goes on and on and on and keeps recycling throughout the centuries. It's time for us to face that history so that we need not live it again. So we have only have time for one more question here. Hi. Um, I appreciate everything you said. Um, as far as the greeting uh, in Africa, that there's goodness in every single person. Uh, with that in mind, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if there are some people that do not have, perhaps, a consciousness. And how do you, does that work for every single person, or have you found that restorative justice only works for, for certain people that might be like sociopaths or psychopaths? Um, yeah, yeah, restorative justice is not a panacea, you know, it's not a magic wand, and it does not work for everybody. It doesn't work if a person doesn't take responsibility. We would never bring a person who has caused harm into a circle with a person that they've harmed if they're not going to take responsibility. If they're going to be in denial about it, if they're going to blame the person and hurt the person. So, restorative justice is, you know, it, it's, it doesn't work all of the time. Thank you, Fanya. Thank you for sharing. Well, now, now we'll have a panel of speakers uh, to come up here, and I ask them to come on up and why they're seating. Uh, I'll just uh, say a few things. First of all, we really appreciate all the people who came out and you're spending your time this evening to talk about this issue. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, members of the judiciary who were here, uh, our probation department, our county administrative office, um, another elected official, Jacques Bertrand from Capitola City Council, uh, uh, who's here. Um, at, but uh, you know, you're all uh, warriors uh, for justice by taking time out of your evening to to learn about this so we can do a better job uh, in the county of Santa Cruz to make sure that we're doing all we can to repair the harm that's been, that, that has been caused here in uh, Santa Cruz. So we have a, a distinguished panel uh, here, and I'm going to introduce them uh, each before their uh, presentation. Um, our first speaker is all the way from San Francisco. Uh, Katie, uh, Katie Weinstein Miller is the Chief of Programs and Initiatives from the Office of San Francisco District Attorney George Gaston. Uh, Katie uh, is, uh, oversees the office's collaborative courts, mental health neighborhood courts, and juvenile units, as well as initiatives focused on restorative justice, young adults, and parallel justice for victims of crime. She has been at the office for 10 years, previously serving as the Assistant District Attorney for Reentry and Truancy. Um, she's a, a Managing Attorney and Director of Policy. Uh, she is a member of the Columbia University's Justice Labs Emerging Adult Justice Learning Community and a recent appointee to the Criminal Justice Task Force of the Bar Association of San Francisco. She uh, holds a JD from Yale Law School, and we know Yale is, is all the best people come from Yale. <laughs> and, and, and a BA from the University of Pennsylvania. So, Katie, don't let, you, you, can, you can stay there. You don't have to, if, if, uh, if you're comfortable. Um. I'm gonna go here. Okay. <laughs> so sorry, 
right for a recent contribution to the Supreme Court from that law school. So glad to be here with all of you. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really an honor to be a part of this and um, really overwhelming to follow Fania when she speaks. So um, I'm going to try to step up to the plate anyway. Um, but um, as was said, my, my work in our office is that I have the honor of overseeing the division of the DA's office uh, that gets to think about ways to do things differently. So the work in my division in our office is everything that represents um, non-traditional approaches to prosecution. Um, and it's uh, work that I love and I'm really honored to do. Um, and I'm also a former public defender. And so I kind of come to the work from a whole different, bunch of different vantage points um, and makes it uh, more complicated and, and more awesome at the same time. And I'm here to talk about uh, neighborhood courts. And is it going to work, Sarah? I just... <laughs> so I'm here to talk about our neighborhood courts, and put simply, neighborhood courts are the way in San Francisco that we uh, resolve a lot of our uh, nonviolent misdemeanor offenses um, using restorative practices, not necessarily a fully restorative model, but restorative practices um, and engaging community members. Uh, and it's um, something that I'm, I'm very happy to offer to you today. So the, the way that we got to starting neighborhood courts, and, and my boss, D.A. Gascon, started them fairly soon after coming to our office in 2011. But he's, he really wanted to start them because of the issues that are up on the screen. We had a lot of kind of questions about how we should be addressing kind of quality of life, crimes, and harm in our community. And I think a lot of the community felt like what happened in our courthouse was really removed from people's lives, was really mysterious, and seemed very disconnected to the actual behaviors that were bringing people into the courthouse. Um, and I think that that extended to a frustration and still does for the folks doing the work, right? I think for DAs, for judges, for juries sitting in hearing <coughs> cases, everyone really felt like for a lot of these kinds of um, harms that what we were doing in court wasn't really the right solution. We like to think we're super unique in San Francisco. We have like the worst case of exceptionalism of <laughs> anywhere. But, but I do feel like a lot of these things really apply in many, many places. Mm -hmm. um, I would add that the other thing we were really seeing was that so much of the time in our courthouse was taken up by these kinds of cases. And in fact, in San Francisco, um, we have three times as many misdemeanors go to trial. Our rate is three times higher than like any other jurisdiction. What that meant was that our courtrooms were spending a lot of time really looking at like kind of low-level cases and our more serious cases and victims who've been seriously harmed for waiting a very long time for their cases to make it through the system. So the idea of neighborhood court is that it hits these four principles. Um, that it's efficient, so the way the model is designed, people can actually fully resolve their case through neighborhood courts before they ever would have even had their first day in traditional court. Um, they're community-driven solutions, and I'll talk about the way the courts run, but the community members who are the, the heart of the model are actually the ones driving the solutions, coming up with the ideas for how to repair the harm. Um, it takes cases out of our courthouse, so it addresses that kind of uh, resource issue that I just touched on, and then we hope that it reduces recidivism for the people involved. Um, because of the restorative model, because of the insights people gain, the work they do, talking and thinking and reflecting on the impact of their actions, and also because it connects people um, with services and supports to address things that may have led them to the, the situation in the first place. These are the key elements of our neighborhood court hearings. Um, is what's called a pre-charging alternative. And so what that means is that when police bring a case to our office for us to make a decision on whether to prosecute somebody, at that moment we decide whether to offer the individual the opportunity to be in neighborhood court. And I want to be clear when we say like it's voluntary, like it's a voluntary, it's like a choice within boundaries, right? <laughs> so it's basically the choice of do you want to do this alternative or we are charging your case. So like it's not an awesome choice, right? <laughs> but it's a real choice. And what's important about that is that the only cases in which we offer it are cases where we otherwise 100% would actually be going forward and charging the case. 
So it's not a net widener. It's not a place where we send cases like that the evidence is bad for, right? It's really cases that are going out of the system that otherwise we would be working with traditionally. Um, they're confidential. What happens in neighborhood court stays in neighborhood court. Uh, if a case doesn't resolve that way, we've never um, used that information in the actual prosecution. Uh, that's important because we want people to have honest and difficult dialogue. Um, and, and to Fania's point, it's also a place for accountability. This is not a fact-finding venue. Our community volunteers are not trying to find guilt or innocence. It's for an individual who's ready to come into the space um, and talk about what they did and, and address the harm that came from it. Um, and uh, it's, as I said before, community-based and volunteer-driven. I'll talk about our volunteers and uses restorative principles, but is not one of the kind of uh, restorative circles or models that Fania was talking about. I would say, however, that it very much incorporates the three R's. So these are the typical kinds of cases we have in our neighborhood court. I'm not going to read them all. You can see them. Um, but as I said before, it's generally non-violent misdemeanor offenses. We do also take some cases that come to our office as felonies, so more serious crimes. But the bulk of the cases are these, the kind of cases listed up here. And then in terms of who's eligible, neighborhood court is a model for adults. Um, we actually do have a restorative justice model we use for um, our young people in San Francisco as well. Um, I think it's closest to victim offender dialogues. We also don't like the name and we call it restorative community conferencing. Um, but in this case, it's for adults. Um, people can go into the program one time. Uh, and we look at kind of people's criminal history. Um, obviously, like I said, we make sure that they're willing to kind of take accountability in that discussion. And then if there's restitution owed and the victim wants it, we do have to have an expectation that they're willing to um, address that. And I think that's imperfect. I think it's something we need to work on. And we want to make sure, of course, that this model isn't inequitable for people. So one thing we're talking about is ways to give people opportunities to actually <laughs> create restitution for themselves if they, if they don't have the means to pay. In terms of our adjudicators, who are amazing, wonderful, compassionate people, um, they are volunteers. They are members of our community. They're retired folks. They're students at the colleges in San Francisco. They're small business owners, a variety of professionals. Everyone who participates goes through 25 hours of training on the way into being an adjudicator, and then ongoing training around kind of everything from restorative circles to uh, what services may be out in the community that can address the needs of individuals who come before them, all kinds of issues. Um, and you know, I think they're fabulous. And I would say that um, I think it's rewarding for them. We have about 60 at any given time, and we have a wait list of about 40 people at any given time waiting to become a volunteer adjudicator for our neighborhood courts, which leads to like a lot of <laughs> tough decisions about when we kind of rotate people out. So what actually happens in this mysterious neighborhood court? So um, neighborhood courts are located in the community in San Francisco. We have 10 police districts, and they're at at least one site in each of those districts. The idea is, as much as possible, to hold the, that, the hearing for that case in the community where the crime happened, where the harm happened. Um, they are in churches. They're in community buildings. They're in all different kinds of spots that offer it to us free of charge, which is also lovely. They're in the daytime, and they're also in evenings. We offer evening sessions so that um, people who want to volunteer as adjudicators but can't do it during the day have the opportunity, and also so that participants who have obligations during the day can be in neighborhood court. Um, and the way it works is somebody comes into the room. We have a lot of conversation. I, say, I shouldn't say we, because lawyers stay all the way out of it. But there is great conversation to make sure they understand the process. A lot of time spent on that. Um, and then the police report is read, and there's a very rich conversation around the harm that came out of the event. Um, the volunteers hear from the person about ways that they think they can address the harm caused, and then they have a conversation between themselves and give the person what we call directives, tasks that they can do to repair the harm caused. And here are some examples of the kind of directives we do. Sometimes it's community service, and it may happen where the victim wants them to do work or where they want to. A lot of reflective work. Um, and something called community restitution in some cases. I'm going to really quickly say what that is. But I want to say this last one here, support services and specialized classes, but particularly support services, is really about 
then hooking the individual up with help that they may need to address things that are leading to them coming into this, these kinds of situations. Um, in some cases, we ask people to pay what's called community restitution. That money goes into a fund that on an annual basis our office gives out in the form of small grants to nonprofits all over the city um, for projects that they come up with that they think will increase the cohesion and livability of their communities. And these are our results at the moment. So from 2017, our statistics, you can see we handled about 300 cases last year this way. 96% of participants appeared for their hearings. If you are someone who works in the courts, you know that's a really high appearance rate for people coming in when they're facing a case. And 91% of them successfully completed the program. Um, we've had over 3,600 cases since we started, and I have to say that we've gotten so much great feedback from people who come through both as someone who is harmed and individuals who've gone through as a participant, both of which I think are really important. Um, given a really great amount of money back to the community and the cost measure, a RAND study has found that cases that we do through Neighborhood Court are 82% less expensive than cases we prosecute traditionally. And that goes right to your 8 to 1 ratio that you said. So I think that's like totally proof <laughs> why this is great. Um, and then I do want to acknowledge um, that we're really excited because we, uh, because RAND was also just funded to do a very in-depth evaluation of the program looking at all measures, um, so hope to come back at some point with good news. Also funded by the federal government, which is like shocking that they would fund San Francisco to do anything right now, <laughs> so surprising and great, um, and happy to answer any questions. hear from all the speakers before we do questions. Uh, the next uh, speakers are a duo uh, that came the farthest for this event. Uh, they are from Hawaii. Uh, Judge Leslie Kobayashi uh, was nominated by President Barack Obama, the last president that we liked, on, <laughs> uh, in April 2010 and confirmed by the U.S. Uh, Senate as a United States District Judge uh, in the District of Hawaii in December 2010. Prior to confirmation, Judge Kobayashi served as a United States Magistrate Judge in the District of Hawaii. She was a practicing lawyer for 16 years and handled a variety of civil trial matters, including the defense of attorneys, physicians, and other professionals in civil litigation and commercial litigation. She received, she received her BA degree from Wellesley College and her JD degree from Boston College School of Law. Welcome, Judge Kobayashi. With her is Lauren Walker, uh, who's the director of Hawaii Friends of, Re of Restorative Justice. She's an adjunct uh, associate professor at the University of Hawaii uh, with the Office of Public Health Studies. We were really welcoming her back because she has a history here in Santa Cruz and her daughter went to school here at UCSC. Uh, uh, Ms. Walker is a health educator and restorative uh, lawyer using public health approaches, including um, restorative justice and solution-focused approaches to help prevent and address injustice and crime. She designs, implements, evaluates, and publishes the results of group processes addressing conflict and reconciliation. She is a senior Fulbright specialist and trains on peacemaking and conflict management skills internationally and nationally. She is an adjunct associate professor for the University of Hawaii where she has taught administration of justice, communication, ethics, and business courses. Uh, she is also the executive director of the Hawaii Friends of Restorative Justice, and she's been interviewed on uh, all sorts of national radio, and she even has a website, laurenwalker.com, where many of the 50 plus, plus publications about her work can be downloaded. So uh, please welcome these two from Hawaii. She's a good friend, and she introduced me to restorative justice and restorative principles. 
Um, when I became a district judge in 2010, which is a great job, I love it, um, but a large part of my job is really putting people in prison for long periods of time. I do that several times a week. Mm -hmm. And I thought as I did it, to be thoughtful about it, how, what are the, what are the goals in putting these people in prison? Um, and, and it's sort of set mm -hmm. out in the law, and one of the purposes of sentencing is to impose a sentence that is sufficient but not greater than necessary to meet the goals of sentencing. And those goals are to provide just punishment for the offense that was committed, uh, so it's a punishment-based part of it. Part of it is to uh, dissuade other people from committing those types of offenses. And there's another component, which is to provide an opportunity for rehabilitation. So I really thought about this, and I thought, you know, what is the best use of my abilities in terms of being part of this process? And one I thought was giving process, which is allowing all of the people involved, not just the attorneys, speak about the sentencing and about the offense and about what's going forward and inviting and encouraging those to bring in victims. And not just victims, because a large part in federal court, especially in the District of Hawaii, it's, it's drug distribution, it's methamphetamine distribution. So there really isn't a victim, we're all victims of that. It's you know, destroying the fabric of the community uh, in Hawaii because of methamphetamine, because it affects the families, it affects the, the, the community relationships. So a large part of that would be their immediate family or friends and so forth. So to the extent that they have family and friends who support them, because many of them do, I encourage their attorneys to bring them to court. And I try to incorporate restorative principles in my sentencing. I try to start out and emphasize what the goals of sentencing are, and then talk about uh, what are the... Uh, the factors involved in the particular offense to which the person either pled guilty or been convicted. Um, going through the bad factors, the harm that they've caused, and so forth, and then going through the mitigating factors. You know, what have they done in their lives that, that makes them uh, a viable candidate to be a, a positive member of our community? And then I invite the lawyers to speak about those, those principles and so forth. And I think this all goes back to those of us who are parents or even how we were raised, right? What's the first thing that you learn, right? You're two, three, four years old, you're in preschool, what have you, you're playing with your friends, and of course somebody grabs somebody else's toy or hits somebody or bites somebody or what have you. And so what's the first thing that the, the adult people do? Well, they say, say you're sorry, right? Because what we want is we want a recognition, you learning, you don't bite somebody else. Right? And then we want also for you to take responsibility for that. I did this to you. And you want an acknowledgement, both the person being bitten and the biter, to acknowledge, you are a person that I hurt, I made you cry, um, and, I, and I feel badly about that. So I think that's the principles that I want to see in my courtroom during a sentencing. Um, I need that person to recognize um, the harm that he or she is committed to our community and to his or her community um, to recognize that. Because until they internalize that, they're just going to, as they say, do time. Um, the second thing is really to take responsibility. So lots of times we have in the law, um, you're required to give the person an opportunity for allocution so they can get up and speak on their behalf. And I encourage people to do it, but I tell them it's, they're not going to be, it's not going to be held against them if they do. And the reason for that is for them to stand up there and take responsibility. So a lot of them will say, or they'll write me a letter, that's become sort of part of our culture, they don't judge Kobayashi <laughs> like they wrote a letter. Because lots of people are not able to do public speaking, to get up in front of a, in a federal courthouse, which is you know, very impressive and big, and, and speak from the heart. You know, they're frightened, you know, they're shameful. Uh, so I, I encourage them to write a letter. If they want to read the letter, if they want to say anything, to that, I encourage them to do it. But I try to make it a dialogue. Because a lot of them say, you know, I want to apologize to you, Judge Kobayashi, I did this that and the So well, thank you. Thank you for recognizing that on behalf of our community, I accept that. But who are these people behind you? Is that your mother, your grandmother, all these people? Yeah. Do you want to speak to them? <laughs> Court reporters hate that because they turn around. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone, they start jabbering away. 
and she's just making the best guess she can. <laughs> but that becomes a huge moment usually in the sentencing. Because then they say, for they speak from the heart, and they're looking eye to eye to the people they've harmed. And that starts the beginning of the atonement and the planning for the future. So that's a little bit how I've, I've incorporated some of the restorative principles. Lauren will tell you about this great program she started in our federal courts and having restorative circles. Thanks, thanks. And Leslie's an awesome judge. I've seen her since. And I just want to say, uh, my daughter went to UCSC, but I am a high school dropout from SoCal. <laughs> criminal here in the state of Hawaii and in, um, in Santa Cruz I was in a little gang my friends here who um, her sister was in my little gang and um, we did a lot of theft we did all, all kinds of bad stuff but when I was 16 um, also my family had a lot of difficulties my grandmother moved here in 1930 there she worked there on Mission Street there used to be a box factory my grandmother worked at it she was a housekeeper she worked in Pastiempo and places like that and, and we were really poor and had a hard time and I learned really early after I got arrested when I was 16 for theft, I mean for um, selling marijuana. Um, my problems were social in nature. It wasn't, it, they were using a criminal justice system against me, but it was really a social problem. So anyway, luckily I did move to Hawaii, left um, California and became a lawyer. And, uh, <laughs> For a while, I realized too, it you know the legal system really didn't get to these issues. So um, I went back to school and got a master's degree in public health uh, 20 years ago, and so we developed this process. It's just a simple group process for helping individual incarcerated people address their social problems, <coughs> make amends with the people that they have harmed in their lives, with their community, give an opportunity for the community, the family, to experience some healing. Um, so it's about reconciliation, the purpose, healing, and needs for a law abiding life. How do you live a law abiding life? I'm, I'm dirt poor. How do I live? You know, I'm addicted to drugs. How can I live a law abiding life? These circles address these issues. So it's a public health approach. And we look at what's right with people, like what Fanny was saying. You know, what's good about you instead of what's wrong? We look at what's good. You know, what are your goals and visions for the future? Um, how have you overcome your past problems? So, um, we believe the individual is the best expert of their own life. Nobody knows you more than you, nobody knows your past, nobody knows what you've overcome. And so we really recognize that, we work on that it's a specific um, goal of our process. And so, we're, and we super, we're very mindful and really practice. Fania was a perfect example of um, <laughs> what we do, and so we have this non-judgmental awareness that we practice mindfulness. <coughs> and so we look at people and we say, what are the, wow, you've got a red cart. Whoa, you have a, a mattress, you know, you're, you've got a good hat. We look at people's strengths and we compliment them on it. We compliment them. How have you managed to live on the streets of, I think it's Toronto, how have you managed to live? for, you know, these years. Awesome. And um, we, we look at all of these different needs people have during these circles. The circle takes about three hours. It's very, very emotional. And, um, and we look at all these things. Uh, we've done so far in the state of Hawaii, 160 of these. And uh, we've done 13 now for the federal court. We've had over 700 people participate, 100% satisfaction. 100% said it was positive, including prison staff who participate. Mm -hmm. And um, it, the research shows it increases children's optimism whose parents have had these circles. And it also does decrease the children's, um, their, their trauma about it. They don't think about it so much and they're, um, they, they have healing. And we also have reduced recidivism by 26%. And these are for people who wanted a circle, but they didn't get it. They got out of prison before we could give it to them. So it's a really good, this is a really good study because it looks at people who wanted it and didn't get it, and people who wanted it and got it. And the people who got it have less recidivism. Um, prison staff are more optimistic. And um, 
the participants, and they also, this is really important, the red part, the participants who had a circle, even, because there's relapse, people go back to prison. Even in those cases, the families are still happy they had a circle. They're still grateful they had that opportunity to have their voice heard. So um, they say, we talked about things we never talked about before. And we had this modified thing. Uh, we have a lot of papers. <laughs> it's a view from my house. <laughs> so um, yeah, any information you want, we have a website that has all the papers. So mahalo. <laughs> I know you're wondering, uh, they've come a long way for a short presentation. They will also be presenting to our criminal justice partners at the court's uh, house tomorrow uh, to, to meet with judges and other uh, members of, of the criminal justice community to talk about what they're doing in the greater depth. So uh, we haven't flown them out. From the furthest uh, uh, guests to uh, those closest to us, our next speaker is Alaya Vautier. Close, close. All right. Uh, she manages the restorative justice program here at the Conflict Resolution Program. Uh, she was trained as a community mediator in 2009 with SEEDS in Berkeley. Uh, prior to her current position, Alaya was a volunteer mediator with the Parent Teen Mediation Program. Uh, and the Victim Offender Dialogue Program uh, since 2011, and the Family Affordable Med Mediation Program since 2014. She earned her master's degree in international policy studies with a specialization in conflict resolution and negotiation in 2005. She has gone through the world uh, as part of that research, and she, today she designs and leads trainings on communication <coughs> Conflict Resolution and Restorative Justice for the Conflict Resolution uh, Center, as well as facilitate mediations and dialogues with youth in the juvenile justice system as part of the Parent Teen Mediation Program and the Victim Offender Dialogue Program. Uh, she's one of our own. Please welcome Eliza. Thank you. As President Leopold mentioned, I work locally here with the Santa Cruz um, County, uh, oh my gosh, I know where I work, <laughs> the Conflict Resolution Center of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we have the Victim Offender Dialogue Program and the Parent Teen Mediation Program, which works with youth in the juvenile justice system, as well as being targeted from the system. Um, I was asked to speak today specifically about the slice of restorative justice as um, a victim-centered process. So I'm going to speak mostly on that specific topic and a little bit about um, victim offender dialogues. Um, and as, as Fania mentioned, as other people mentioned, um, I also use the terms victim and offender throughout this presentation for ease of communication. But in general, when we're in an interaction, uh, we don't use those terms. Um, Fania said it really well, it kind of reifies people in a way they don't necessarily need to be or want to be reified. And so uh, we often just don't use terms altogether or as you've probably heard tonight, we say uh, the person who received the harm or the person who's caused the harm. So this was brought up a little bit earlier, This the same um, points that I'm going to bring up, but I'm hoping um, there's learning and repetition. <laughs> I'm going to hear it again. Um, so when it comes to addressing um, crime and wrongdoing, the criminal justice system asks really different questions than the restorative justice system. Um, Fania, really emphasize this, what laws have been broken, who did it, and what do they deserve is where criminal justice goes. It really emphasizes the, the offender is really focused here. Um, and, it's, and, and who's been harmed? Well, the state's been harmed, and laws have been broken, and that's really what's um, focused on, on this system. The sort of justice asks who's been hurt, what are their needs, and whose obligations are those needs? So we're looking more at needs and roles, and especially, uh, an inclusive of victims' needs. So that's, that's really emphasized that <coughs> victims are brought back into the circle with restorative justice and very much excluded with criminal justice. 
and then just to emphasize this a little bit more, both systems see justice through very different lenses. Criminal justice sees crime as a violation of law and an offense against the state. So when a, when a crime or wrongdoing happens, the state steps in uh, and speaks up for the offender, um, no, excuse me, for the victim. The victim is no longer a part of the process. This is now the offender and the state, and that's really where the focus is. Restorative justice says crime is a violation of people and relationships. And who's getting harmed? People are getting harmed. Relationships are getting harmed. That's what we need to focus on, is the harms, the needs, and how to repair that. Criminal justice says violations create guilt, and restorative justice says violations create obligations. Whose obligations are these? Whose role is it to uh, heal the harm, or address the harm, or work towards making right the wrong as best as possible? Criminal justice says justice involves the state to determine guilt and blame and impose punishment and pain, and the central focus is offenders getting what they deserve. So again, this is very offender focused, and victims are really on the outside. Restorative justice uh, involves the victims, offenders, community members in an effort to put things right, and is much more focused on victim needs and offender responsibility for repairing the harm. So it's again that same premise that's been brought up that. Restorative justice brings the people who've been most affected by an action, a wrongdoing, or a crime, or a harm, brings those people in to address the harm and make right the wrong. Uh, Markham Wright is just a, a scholar and <coughs> practitioner in the field, and he says, the harm done to the victim takes precedence and serves to organize the essence of the interaction between the key players. So this, this is another example of how victim needs really um, in a well-run system should be really a focus that should be centralized. When, when the restorative justice movement um, sort of took, took hold here, it's sort of institutionalized for, version when it started in Canada and here in the States, that movement started with a focus on the needs that were created when crime occurs. So specifically, what are the needs of victims? and how do we address those needs more effectively. So anyone who's probably been <coughs> excuse me, a victim or experienced crime, that because crime is seen uh, by the state as occurring between the state and the offender, then the victim's not involved. The victim often experiences the, the whole process as a bystander or maybe a spectator to the whole process. The, they don't have a voice. Uh, they don't have much power. Um, they don't get much information, they're really sidelined in the process. And so restorative justice really aims to bring the victim back into the process in a really meaningful way, in a way that benefits them and, and benefits the community. Also expands that um, group of stakeholders to involve, um, to include victims and community members, and, and giving victims choice every step of the way in this process. Um, so victim offender dialogues. We briefly talked about this is one mechanism for meeting victim needs, and it's it's a um, very safe, very facilitated interaction between it can be between victims and offenders. It can be, be between um, a victim and uh, surrogates. It can be stand-ins. Um, these can be face-to-face -face interactions. They can also be letter exchanges. They can be video exchanges. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways that you can have a, like a dialogue or an interaction with the people who cause the harm and the people who receive the harm. Um, they're voluntary, <laughs> much like they are in uh, San Francisco. Um, for the offender side, anyway, they're, they're um, voluntary. But they have to have a willingness. Offenders have to have a willingness to participate. They have to meet certain criteria <coughs> to participate. But it's absolutely voluntary for victims, of course. Um, they're not pressured to be a part of this. They've given all the information and shown the benefits that could occur if they were a part of this, but absolutely it's voluntary and um, can come from their side or our side. And, and as Bonnie mentioned, it's not appropriate for every crime and every situation, and it's not appropriate for every victim, and there are um, people who don't want anything to do with the person that caused them that harm. And that's <coughs> absolutely okay. And there's people that maybe aren't ready for many, many years, and then eventually they want to have an interaction with that person. And so uh, being sensitive to those needs is really important. Um, it can be parallel to or outside the criminal justice system. So with, with the youth that we work with here in Santa Cruz, we get um, 
folks refer to our program through juvenile probation, and sometimes these youth have an option to not have to go through the courts and not go through the system, and they can come through our program instead. And we set up, um, if, it, if we find it appropriate, we set up a dialogue, they meet with the person they harmed, and they get to repair the harm directly that way. And then sometimes if these uh, youth have been sentenced and their parents and the court is asking them to have a dialogue with the person they harmed. And so there's different ways that this can occur uh, in both youth and adult systems. And just to be clear, it's, it's not mediation. Early on in um, the movement, it was called victim offender mediation. But mediation implies sort of an equal playing field, an equal moral ground that maybe both parties had contributed to the conflict, and maybe both parties had some responsibility to get themselves out of it. That's not this. You have two people, one who's really specifically been harmed, and another one who's caused the harm. We're going to center the needs of the victim, but be also very supportive of the offender, so it's, it's, it's not a mediation. There's a lot of planning that goes on behind the scenes um, to come to a dialogue, and um, that's really 90% of the work, is, is the back and forth preparing victims, preparing offenders, make sure it's appropriate. A minute and a half. <laughs> in uh, the restorative justice system, so this is, this is a victim's quote, in the restorative justice system, I was a part of the process. Voluntarily choosing to meet with the offender was crucial to my healing process and crucial to the accountability and healing of the offender. So there's a lot of benefits that can come to, excuse me, to the victim by being a part of this. They finally have a voice. They get to share their story. They get to share their story directly with the person who caused them harm. Uh, they get to hear directly from the person who caused them harm, their remorse, their apology, how they feel about it. Um, they get people to experience a sense of safety and reintegration and support and all these good things. I have 45 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite translate. So there are critiques of the restorative justice system from a victim's viewpoint. I think it's really important that practitioners such as ourselves and people who run programs stay really nimble, we stay flexible, that we listen to the viewpoints of the people that we are actually trying to help or we're at risk of um, sort of becoming the enemy again, you know. So as, as restorative justice gets more and more popular and becomes part of our institutions, we want to make sure that we don't replicate uh, the harm of our institutions. And these um, are valid critiques, and uh, there's different ways that we can um, work with them. The first one is that uh, facilitators may not totally understand the impacts of the crime. On a, on a victim and cause more harm than good. And so facilitators really need to be trained well and, and the program needs to be run well. And there's a lot of safeguards built in so that the, the victim can opt out at any time. The facilitator should know when a case is appropriate or inappropriate to move forward and how to not cause harm to the victim. Um, a lot of our programs come to us through offender referral programs. And so we just have to be aware that we're not just working for the offender, but that we are also here for the victim, that we need to have a real understanding of their needs. Um, I read somewhere that someone said, well, how can it be restorative if all the need needs of the victim are not being met? And, and I think that's valid. That when a crime occurs, uh, victims experience a lot of needs, and they're all totally different. Some of those needs might be employment, or, or housing, or counseling, or rehab. And so restorative justice, I think, really meets a slice of those needs. But I think the restorative justice system and the justice system needs to be uh, responsive to a wide variety of needs for victims in order to really be of value. And letting offenders off the hook is a common um, criticism here in the mainstream media. It says, oh, this is just, you know, they get off easy. They just have to go have some liberal, you know, dialogue with someone. <laughs> and the youth I work for, I work with, it's really obvious that they, um, this is the hardest thing they have to do. They'd rather go meet with a judge and, you know, and have them give them terms than have to sit face to face with the person they harmed and come up with a plan and repair the harm. So it's um, not a valid criticism. In some cases. So thank you very much. Wow. <laughs>
The art and poetry on the wall are from the Santa Cruz County Jail. Uh, this is an exhibit that will be up for the end of the year. Uh, and you can come out for first Friday tomorrow night and they'll, they'll be having uh, a, uh, this will be open for a reception tomorrow, so I encourage you to come back. Uh, so it looks like uh, Angela has the first question. I have a question from Ms. Weinstein Miller. With your 91% successful completion rate, which is outstanding, is that just of the neighborhood court process, or is it also of completion of all the directives that were assigned? And if so, what was the time process on average for those cases? Is this perfect? Yeah. Um, so, so the ninety-one percent means that ninety-one percent of the cases were able to close up successfully, and that includes both going to their conference, to their hearing, and then fulfilling the directives. Um, but I want to say about that that I think being nimble is a part of the process. So there may be times when someone in full good faith is trying to complete all of their directives and something may come up and it may not work for them to do kind of one thing. And we'll have conversations about that, but overwhelmingly they're completing all of their directives. And so 91% of the cases are closed as successful and not brought back for charging. And then for the time period, it can depend. Um, so we are able to complete, depending on what the directives are, somebody could complete it within 30 days, which is before they would have the date that they would first appear in court in a regular case. Um, sometimes we give people a longer period of time because they may have directives that could take longer. So for example, um, somebody who's coming in and disclosing that um, they are, um, they have substance abuse issues and that that's what is leading to like the event in question um, one of their directives may be to um, achieve a certain level of kind of engagement in a program in the community for substance treatment. And so we want to give them the time to do that. Um, so it depends on what it's about and what they need and what the harmed person needs. But I would say the outer limit would be six months that we would give somebody to do kind of a range of things with, with some exceptions. I think we really do need to be flexible and I think it's important to remember for like the prosecutors in this space that we have up to a year to file a misdemeanor <laughs> in our courthouse, right? So really, there's no reason to not give the person the time to handle the case in the way that we think makes the most sense and is most connected to what actually happened. A question over here. Thank you. As an activist, I've been deeply exploring issues of class and justice. And so I wanted to ask, Two people, but anybody can weigh in, but uh, there's two points where I feel that issues about class are maybe very relevant here, and I'm very deeply curious. The first is I believe that we live in a tremendously encrusted and kind of hardened class society full of inequality, so a lot of the crimes that people are committing are coming out of issues related to class, especially issues related to poverty or lack of opportunity, but also, for example, in the field of domestic violence, maybe having a lot taken and then maybe not being able to prosecute um, because of whatever reason. So, in other words, it sounds like if a person has to commit a crime, there has to be a, a lawful crime you know, made for this system to come in. In other words, it's through the legal system. And I see that being a problem. And then the other problem is, um, Cassie, on the end, I think you mentioned this more directly, Restorative justice doesn't necessarily get to all the needs the victims have, such as maybe housing or uh, money for whatever, education or whatever. So I'm really interested not for you to sell me on RJ, but to be really critical at this point about what RJ can't do because basically I, I need to know why I should even bother with the legal system that is so much comes out of the whole privileged class um, structure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it was more of a critique than a, than a question, but if it wanted to have someone... I would just, sure. All I would say is that the people that we help are, are in prison. They didn't have a choice. They're there. They're there. So this is like, what's the alternative, you know? So, but I agree with you that it's, there's, it's sad. I just came from New Zealand. And actually, New Zealand did do great with their children, but they're, sadly, they have increased in the adult population in prisons. They followed our model, basically. And um, you know, we talked there just last week in Wellington that it's, it's political issues. It's political. 
know, we're not taking care of people. And yeah, that's terrible. And I think in federal court, maybe we also see, uh, you know, there's certainly in, in drug prosecutions, but I see a lot of white collar crime um, that's also being prosecuted, and these people come from very privileged backgrounds. Uh, I would say in every case that I have um, sentenced someone in child pornography, they're all been white, male, college or uh, higher than college, mm -hmm. educated, um, very wealthy, I mean, you know, making good money, uh, professionals, married, uh, own properties, <coughs> investments. So, you know, I understand what you're saying in terms of certain types of prosecutions, clearly, um, for instance, a criminal gang in, in prisons um, that, would, that went to trial in front of me. Um, I felt like I was sentencing the same person over and over again, young men who had been uh, taken out of the home when they were young because of abuse issues and then uh, basically incarcerated as children and then when they're 18 became incarcerated as adults. So certainly there's some aspect of that, that but there are large aspects of people who are being prosecuted who do come from what you recognize as a very privileged class and they are committing crimes mm -hmm. uh, against our society uh, and they are being prosecuted. So it's not a perfect system for sure. Um, there's certain things that we should need to do on the back end in terms of the sentencing and, and being effective in changing people. Um, but on the front end, the prosecution might not be even-handed, but at least what I'm seeing in federal court is there are a lot of people who are being prosecuted who don't come from underprivileged <coughs> backgrounds. So I guess I would say a couple of things. Um, if, if you work in the building I work in, the Hall of Justice, <coughs> Classic name, always. Um, you know, it's, it's impossible to work there and not see the disparities visually and of the lives of the people coming into the building. Um, I don't think that kind of creating one new model at a time is going to fix that, but I do think we always have to challenge ourselves when we start, when we create a new kind of offering from the justice system, we need to challenge ourselves to make sure that we're looking at who's getting to participate and benefit in that and make sure that they are representative of the people coming into our courtrooms in terms of socioeconomic status, race, and ethnicity, right? Um, and that's something we do look at for neighborhood courts. Are the people who are getting offered neighborhood court kind of a, a meaningful part of the people who otherwise are coming through the justice system? And that's why things like the restitution issue are really hard for us. We want to make sure that we can't just offer it to people who can afford to participate. Um, and the second thing I would say about not meeting all the needs of the victims is that the regular justice system sucks at that, right? <laughs> like, we, we, we really are way more limited in what I think we can meet for our victims. Um, uh, one of the parts of my title is that some of the work that I do in my office is parallel justice. And what parallel justice means is that as we're creating more kind of off-ramps and new ways of doing things for the person who create, commits the harm, we need to make sure that we're also offering employment opportunities and housing and kind of holistic approaches to the person who in that situation was harmed, right? So I think that's really a mandate for DA's offices and parts of the justice system that work with victims to make sure that we're being holistic for kind of everyone who comes through. And we just have a very long way to go to do that. Um, we've been trying to do that in a lot of ways in our office. And also, still, I think the people who go through, the, the harmed people who participate in our restorative processes, neighborhood courts, and our juvenile model, would say that that is a much more positive experience for them. Great. Uh, Angel. Thank you so much. These, all of these presentations, and even the first one that opened everything, uh, the whole dialogue. Um, my name is Ima Sumak, and I. Um, I've been hearing a lot about restorative justice. Um, I work a lot in healing, and so I'm very curious. It's an area that's very attractive to me. I work in education, so I see this in education a lot as well. What I'm curious about is if you've seen this also beginning to kind of take traction in um, the prison system. Um, the reason I ask this is um, I've heard that it has, right? I mean, Angela Davis talks about like, oh, we're beginning to see the reform. Um, but when you have people who have boots on the ground, like my son, my son is in prison, um, and he was a sophomore in college when he was imprisoned. Um, so now he's, 
in doing all the programs that you know he has access to. He's um, been trying to advance himself and and really like you know take advantage of what he can while he's there, as well as writing a letter to the family you know that was harmed and like you know which was his best friend's family and just deeply like honoring their their grief. Um, and, and so we're, we're really proud of his like his willingness to kind of embrace the experience. And yet it seems that the system itself doesn't recognize that because he's not finding, like none of these opportunities were available, right? Um, and, and he had no prior criminal history or any of that. Um, so, so he didn't have that going in. And then now that he's in, regardless of his progress, um, they've decided to transfer him. There's no, um, like, no where is he going to go? Or are there going to be programs? There's no continuity. So I'm just curious as to, you know, this this idea that are we truly progressing or is it? Um, yeah, I, I'm just wondering because when I hear about that progress and then as, as a mother we're experiencing a very different reality, it, we feel a conflict. So I'm just sure. curious about this. Thank you. So the, the, are we moving forward with these kind of programs or are we, are we standing still? Fanya, I don't know. Um, I, I have a, a cousin who's in San Quentin. Um, he was arrested when he was 14. He was a child, a child as an adult, for um, homicide as well as sexual um, assault. Um, and he was, he's been in for almost 30 years now. But when he came to San Quentin about five years ago, things started to happen. He started to really, really uh, change. Uh, when we used to talk to him before he went to San Quentin, he would deny you know, any responsibility uh, or minimize. Or... But once he got to San Quentin, there was a restorative justice program there. It's called the Victim Offender Education Group. And lifers usually go into that program. It's a very intense program uh, where in the first year, uh, participants contemplate, uh, discuss, write about, speak about the harm that they have caused and the rippling effects of that harm, um, not just to the, to the individuals, the family members who survived, uh, but society. They do a very in-depth, detailed um, uh, sort of inventory of all of the ways in which they've caused harm for a whole year in this program. And then they spend the next year doing the same thing about the harms that have been caused to them. Because everybody in prison practically is, has been sexually abused or physically abused or hurt in some way, the whole thing about hurt people hurting people. So they do that inventory. And um, that work has been so powerful. Well, then he, it sort of culminates in some persons who have been harmed coming in to do a circle with the men in blue, they call them. Not matched to, the per, to, to, to their harms. In other words, the, the people, the persons who have been harmed that they're meeting with in the circle are not ones that they have had a personal, you know, have personally harmed, but have experienced similar harms. And I went to one of those culminating circles with uh, persons who caused harm, uh, surrogates there, and it was just powerful. Anyway, back to my cousin. He's gone through this whole process, and he is a different person, literally. No. <coughs> literally. Um, he takes full responsibility. He doesn't minimize. He is on a mission, you know, especially when it comes to sexual assault with the Me Too movement and everything. Uh, to model what it means to uh, take responsibility, uh, responsibility, model what it means to uh, recognize and repair. Uh, he hasn't really been able to meet with the persons that he directly harmed, but he's met with a lot of surrogates, and, and the transformation is amazing. And this has happened with lots of other men who have been lifers, and they have gotten out. The parole board sees that. And uh, so we have a number of, of lifers now in Oakland who are doing work. Um, so I just wanted to I just wanted to talk about that particular program 
as an example of really good work that's going on. And then I'm not going to keep talking, but also abolitionists have been doing really great work, have had great successes in shutting down prisons, stopping new prisons, um, um, and ban the box legislation. I think, and of course, you know, the narrative change with restorative, with uh, 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 mass incarceration. Many Americans do not believe in that it's helpful. Uh, so I just wanted to call attention to those things. Okay. I just I just had a quick thing for let's see you now. Well, maybe we have a question. Anyway, that um, they are really working to expand the vote program that Anya was mentioning throughout the state. They're expanding to all the different prisons. And if you go to the um, the website for the prison that your son is transferred to. They have a list of the, the rehabilitative programs that are there. <clears throat> and a lot of times, the um, men and women don't know what's going on. At the, they, don't, they don't do any kind of orientation when you go to prison. They say they leave that to the gangs to orient <laughs> the, the men uh, how they live in that prison. Anyway, so, you know, giving, giving him as much information about what's available and asking him to go to the community resource manager the way to go. Okay, we have, we have time for a couple more questions. <coughs> um, first, I want to thank everyone for coming in, for giving the presentations. You do seem incredibly good. Uh, my name is Luke Reddy. I'm a student at UCSC. And, yeah, I would not patronize the room by speaking to the prominence of sexual misconduct and violence against women, right? This process seems to pose a substantial potential to aid people who are survivors of those experiences because it is survivor focused, because I think it's spoken to, it emphasizes the needs of and restoring the needs of uh, those who have been harmed, right? Um, but it seems clear from the criticism that the criticisms of victim offender dialogues would be particularly salient in cases um, of sexual crime. So uh, my question would be, is there a particular process that is more but that is better tailored to help those who are survivors of such crimes, those who have been harmed in such a way. If there's a process for restorative justice that in particular caters to their unique needs. Well, um, I'll just, I just got interviewed by the American Bar Association and the article just came out yesterday about this issue of the Me Too movement and if you could use restorative justice and we've used it for sexual assault cases. We don't just do that re-entry circle, we do all kinds of stuff and um, 20 years ago we developed, because I am the victim of a attempted rape and um, attempted murder and I was beaten up severely in Waikiki and um, realized when I was doing this work that you could use this restorative justice stuff, you could use these questions that Fani was saying, like how were you harmed, what do you need to repair the harm, you could use that even if you didn't know the person, because they don't know the guy that tried to kill me, I don't know who he was, 70% of all crime, we don't know who did it, we don't know, the FBI, there is no one arrested, so you can, so one of our earliest projects that we wrote a paper about that's on our website, um, talks about how you can do restorative processes without the other people. They're not there. You know, we don't know who they are. And um, also for people in prison. A lot of the people in prison, they don't know who they hurt. I don't know who the girl was I tried to rape and murder. You know, I don't know. But now, I'm sorry. You know, and um, what can I do? So I think that there are opportunities. And um, it's growing more. There's been um, a lot of pushback in the United States, especially, you know, bringing people together, which I would never do if no one wanted to, you know what I mean? If you don't want to be with the person who did that, and sometimes people deny it anyway. You know, they say they didn't do it. But you could still ask these questions, these Howard Zare questions, you know? How are you affected? What do you need? So. I know, um, so. So we do um, restorative conferencing for kids in San Francisco um, for kind of a short list of what are felony offenses. We don't do it for sexual harm, but I do know that our partners across the Bay and Oakland do some restorative conferences in cases involving um, teen dating violence and other examples of sexual harm between kids and have had some really amazing circles that way. It's not something that we're at yet, but we've been talking about it. Probably only have time for one more question. 
Hi, my name is Annalisa Torres, and I'm also a UCSC student. And uh, my question kind of goes to anyone on the panel here. Um, I'm potentially going to school for law, and so I want to be a lawyer. And is there a way that lawyers can implement reformative justice in their practice, or is it just kind of excluded to prosecutors and judges? And if so, um, do you guys have some critiques or tips for us to use those? So there's, so there's, I forget what his name is, but Lauren knows him. So there's this whole thing about, um, I forget if there's a name for it, but it's like sort of like being thoughtful about represent. So he, how it came about for him is he had taken on this case and he had, um, this dad was killed in a car accident. His kids were in the car and there was a manufacturing defect in the car and he had this, you know, dragged down, knockout, discovery battle and culminated in this trial and they won the trial. And so they got millions of dollars for the, for the survivors, for the wife and the kids. And so um, he told this little kid who was, you know, five at the time, and now he was like nine or something by the time they got the verdict. He said, we won, we won. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, he goes the jury came back and, and said that, you know, whatever the automotive company is responsible. And the kid burst into tears, so he thought, oh, he's so happy, and the kid said, so does this mean that I didn't kill my daddy? Aww. And the guy was just floored, he said, how stupid am I that for four years he didn't recognize that this kid was walking around with this thought of somehow something he did was involved in his father's death. And so he, he, I think it's called transformative, or I don't know what, it's, it's, it's this whole movement about lawyers being thoughtful in how they represent. Yes, you have a client, and you have to represent the best interests of the client, but in the end, we need to do justice, and what does that look like? How do you do it? Yeah, therapeutic justice, or therapeutic law, or jurisprudence, or something. So the whole idea, and it's really taken hold of this in divorce law. You know, so rather than you know have the two spouses at their each other's neck, this whole idea of what do you have in common? You have these kids in common. Okay, so what can we do to move forward? Um, rather than it being an adversarial process, so that's one area I would encourage you to think about. Um, and uh, in, in practice, I think you know that would really. Um, my partner used to say he's like the greatest. My former law partner, he said, you know, there's only three healing arts: the physician heals the body the um, religious practitioner heals the spirit, or heals the soul, but it's only the lawyers who heal the spirit, and the soul, yeah, the soul, <laughs> one of the things, I don't know. <laughs> but this whole idea of lawyers being peacemakers, you know, and, and this idea of where did we get away from that, and that it's somehow this adversarial system, there's only going to be one winner, and, um, you know, not to pick out a scab, but I think the whole thing that why we're all upset for various reasons about the whole Kavanaugh hearing and everything is that it was such a terrible process because it didn't, it, you know, only one people, one person could be right and therefore the other person is wrong. So, it, and the whole point is, is that each person has a story to tell and has to be allowed to be you know, truthful and to be to be held to the point where they can tell their story rather than either be vague and be evasive or, or come forward and tell it. And all of us, I think, especially in this country and that just how jurisprudence has it, there's, there's, there's the truth and there's falsity, but there's a whole bunch of gray in between. And so we're so much in this punitive mode that if you, you know, say the wrong thing, then you're you're black, you're not white, or you're white and you're not black, and that, so what, what does that mean, you know, and how does that move forward with justice? So I encourage you, if you're thinking about going into law, think about being a healer in the law process as a lawyer, in whatever fashion you decide to do, because that's ultimately what I think lawyers should be, is to be carriers of justice and to make our society better and safer, and that's what all these processes are just to make our community safer. Because all of those people we send off to prison, they come home at some point, and they're gonna be our neighbors, and that's why I do what I do, because almost 
50% of the people that are sentenced to federal prisons, we don't have a federal prison in Hawaii. So they go off for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, and then the majority of them go back to Hawaii. And they're going to be living in my neighborhood, you know, so I want to make sure my neighborhood and my those that my kids live in and my family members and loved ones are safe neighborhoods because these people have changed and recognized and accepted responsibility. So go to law school, but be a warrior for justice. <laughs> That's a great way to Incredible women um, are, are doing some amazing work. Uh, there, you can find their work on the web. I encourage you to look. Um, and uh, it's going to be part of this ongoing discussion we want to have here in Santa Cruz about what it is we can take from what we've learned here and, and put it into practice here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, Santa Cruz, the, the Board of Supervisors uh, recently uh, initiated a strategic planning process. Maybe some of you participated in some of the community community planning processes, uh, but we've, we've uh, developed a series of goals uh, that we're trying to follow in all the work that we do, and we do have one on justice that, uh, that, that states that we want to increase public safety through practices, partnerships, and transformative opportunities that respect victims, and that means all victims, and reduce recidivism. So we try to think about this in the work that we do, uh, and it's been, it's been a great learning uh, session to hear from these four uh, powerful women. Uh, I'd like to inter uh, have uh, uh, Professor Craig Haney come up uh, to say some closing remarks, but thank you very much. Please join me. Let's um, thank uh, all of the speakers and also thank Supervisor Leopold who did yeoman service tonight. You have been uh, a remarkably dedicated audience, not only coming out on Thursday night, but, but uh, staying uh, attentive for several hours of what I thought, and I hope you agree, were spellbinding presentations. Um, and I hope you were thinking, as I was thinking, as you listened to all these remarkable people, uh, about whether and how these models can be applied in our community. Um, I'm going to be brief, but let me remind you of the, 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 the tone and the ideas on which we began. Um, Fania asked us to think about a fundamental paradigm shift in how we think about justice and how we practice justice in this community. She talked about doing it in the name of ending suffering. Ending suffering of people who are the survivors of crime. Ending suffering that occurs in the community when crime occurs and also ending the suffering of the people who engage in crime, both before and during and after the, the criminal act. This, this is a process that we have to think about that includes everybody. And it includes not only the people who survive crime, but of course they need to be featured and they need to be the center of this process, but it is a process that includes other people in the community. Most of the people, as many of you know and you heard tonight, implicitly and explicitly, were victims before they were victimizers. And the traditional criminal justice system does not take that into account. And restorative justice attempts to do exactly that. She talked about ending the cycle of harm. And implicit in that comment was the notion that trauma begets trauma. And somewhere along the line, that process has to stop. And there is no place in the traditional criminal justice system to stop that process. Some of you know that on most days or most weeks, I spend most of my time in the worst prison systems in the entire country, talking to people who are at the end of the line. They're in solitary confinement units or maximum security units or supermax prisons somewhere in California or some other state. And I will tell you that when I sit and talk with them, they talk to me about a process that began in the community, almost always with relatively minor crime, in which they were pulled into a system that did none of the things we heard about tonight, did not try to understand what they had done or why, did not give them an opportunity to do any of the things that we heard talked about tonight. There is no place that I know of where trauma begets trauma with more, with more uh, force and viciousness, frankly, than in the traditional criminal justice system. And we in this community have
have to do better than that. It, in, in some instances, it may be the best we can do. But, but if it's the best we can do, that is a sad commentary on who we are and what kind of a community we have. Everybody who spoke to you tonight talked to you about a different and better way of doing what we do in this system. And, and there have to be many, many opportunities where we, even in Santa Cruz, where we pride ourselves on doing such a good job, where we fall short, and you heard tonight how we could do so much better. And I hope that you were stimulated as I was listening about these things, thinking about what we need to do and how we need to change the system, even in our community. It starts here. Maybe the California prison system, where the prison system in the United States is too big a leap. But what we do in this town, in this community, in, in, in this system, is not too big a leap because all of you are part of that process. Finally, you talked about when you talk about a transformation needing to take place at both a systemic and an individual level. We need to change what we do in the system as much as we can. We need to make individual changes, surely with the people who come through the system, but individual changes in our community. We need to change. We need to change how we think about these things. We need to change about change how we think about what justice is and how justice can be dispensed. And she also said, and you heard it from the other speakers as well. One of the hallmarks of a story of justice is that it doesn't depend on experts. It depends on community members. It's our community. It's our process. It, it, it is what we want this system to be. And so hopefully tonight we started a conversation about how to expand this process in this community. I hope you guys, I got lots and lots of ideas about what and how we might do things better. I want to just... To end, to remind you that we want you to fill out the questionnaires that we've given you. I promise you that we will take your responses to those questionnaires, we will integrate them, and we will move to a, another conversation on these issues. So our promise to you is fill out the questionnaires. We'll take your, your responses very seriously. We'll try to formulate the next community discussion about these issues. Um, Sarah asked me to remind you that you've, when you registered tonight, you've, you gave us your email. So you're now on a mailing list. We will send you tonight's materials, the PowerPoint presentation. So you will have all that information to study and think about this so that when we get together again the next time, we will all be that much more informed about these issues. Again, Thank you to all these remarkable speakers. Thank you to all the people who put this event together. And thank you for your attention and dedication. To this.